Let's turn to the Word of God this morning. I want you to turn to Ezekiel in the Old Testament. If you remember that Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel go in that order with lamentations stuck briefly in between. It just helps you as a younger believer uh, to find your way through the Bible. But I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. We're continuing on from our message last week. If you weren't here last week, didn't hear last week's message, we are going straight in. I didn't get time to finish last week, so we are going to carry on from where we left off. But I would advise and suggest that you go back and listen to part one. This is going to be part uh, two here this morning. And we're beginning a new series the four seasons of life. We're going to go into this very thoroughly. But last week we began with cherubims as a type of the redeemed. And we dealt with six points. I'm now going to move to part two of this. Cherubims, a type of the redeemed, part two. And we're going to continue with a further three points that we didn't get time to deal with last week. Please follow with me in Ezekiel Chapter 1 and verse 4. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces. And every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of man under their wings on the four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another. And two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward whither the spirit was to go. They went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightnings, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Let's pray together. Father, we pray, O oh God, for this fire, this Lord God, this glory of God to be present in our gathering this morning. We love you. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ. That's our only merit. Lord God, that's our only basis for fellowship, for communion. It's the only reason why your glory can fill this house this morning. It's the only reason why your spirit can be made manifest in our gathering, revealing the person of Christ. We want to see the man of fire upon the throne. We want to see him high and exalted. And Lord God, we pray pray, O oh God, that out of the midst of the fire of the living God, that we would see a revelation of what a man is to be in Christ Jesus, of what a real Christian is. O oh God, we pray in this meeting this morning, nor God, burn out all the traditions of men. Let your fire be so here that nothing is left but the very image of Christ. O oh God, I pray, burn out all the shackles and traditions.
traditions and religion and worldliness and carnality and fleshliness, oh God. Let there be a fire kindled in this meeting, nor God, through the preaching of your word, nor God, that would burn up every idol, nor God, that would demolish every imagination and strongholds in the minds of men. Oh God, we want nothing but Christ in this church. Oh God, we know our weakness and our frailty. We know how we failed you in the past. And so we come for a fresh, fresh cleansing of the precious blood of the Lamb. Wash us and make us whiter than the snow. And Lord God, let your glory come right now. Oh God, fill these vessels with glory. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit, oh God, that we might be filled with eyes this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Our message part two, cherubims, a type of the redeemed. We saw last week how these unusual creatures of Ezekiel 1, they are a picture to us, a type. If you go through the nine things that we are dealing with on these cherubims, you will see that these strange, unusual, four-winged, four-faced creatures actually have a message for you and I. This was not merely an angelic vision. It was not merely a manifestation of cherubims, of winged creatures to this prophet. It was much, much more. This was the first revelation, the first message, the first encounter with the prophet Ezekiel when God called him to prophesy to his people. Ezekiel chapter one is so essential because it reveals something of God's plan for his people. You see, Ezekiel is being brought into something of what is going to happen with God's people. And it's absolutely essential. These cherubims are always connected to God's glory in the Bible. From Genesis all the way to Revelation. From the beginning of God's work with man, immediately you see cherubims there. To the very end in the book of Revelation, you see these four unusual creatures again. So through the entire working of God with man, he reveals these cherubims and they're always there in his presence as he is dealing with them because they have a message for us. Do you know these are real creatures, real angelic creatures, different than angels, different than seraphim, but they are real supernatural creatures that live in the very presence of God. When you begin to study about the cherubims, you see that they are the guardians of God's glory. They are the protectors of God's throne. They overshadow, they have the most intimate communion with God's throne of any angel that you've ever read about in the Bible. No angels get closer. As we read the Bible, not even redeemed men get closer to the throne of God in heaven than these actual cherubims. They care about the glory of God. They are concerned with the glory of God. And the nine points that we're dealing with about cherubims, as we go through those nine things, you'll see that all nine things are caught up with the glory of God. What are the, these nine points? They have everything to do with it caring about the glory of God. Can I ask you, do you care about the glory of God? Are you a guardian of the glory of God? Well, these cherubims were. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, we read about man having just been put out. Garden of Eden, not Eden, the Garden of Eden. They were put out. The tree of life is in there. Man has eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They have fallen. They have sinned. They now have eyes open to realize their shame. The glory had departed. Now they're naked. They see their nakedness. They sinned against God. They ate of the wrong tree. Knowledge. You know the church is filled with people seeking knowledge. I know facts. I know information. Information is power. Knowing things is power. Your knowledge is dead. Your knowledge is dead. 
Do you realize Christianity isn't about knowledge or being able to argue or win some point or no theology? That is not Christianity. You know what it's about? It's about life. And as soon as they sinned, they were put out by God out of the garden and two cherubim, notice that two cherubims are put at the gateway into Eden. In other words, the entrance into that garden. Why? The tree of life is there. Now as sinners, if they eat of the tree of life, they would live forever. And so God places two guardians, two unusual creatures at the garden of Eden. And it says if not, it wasn't in their hand, but there was also a flame and sword going back and forth to guard the entrance into Eden. Do you know what God was saying? You're not allowed in here. You cannot experience as a fallen sinful man the glory of God, the presence of God and have access to eternal life. You are excluded. And the cherubims were right there at that very point. They are the guardians of eternal life. They are the guardians of God's glory. They are guardians of the very presence of God. You cannot get access. You remember when Cain had killed his brother and he departs. Listen to what it says. He's outside the garden, not inside the garden. But now he sins in killing his brother and he's going to depart. It says that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That meant that even at the gateway to Eden, there was still the presence of God. Outside of the garden was still the presence of God, but Cain went further. Do you know where I believe the presence of God was? Where those two cherubim were, because the cherubim delight in the presence of God. Where the presence of God is, you'll find cherubim. Where you find the cherubim, you'll always find the presence of God. Oh, that Christians would only wake up to that. Wherever you get a real church to have the presence of God, the glory of God, the manifestation of God. We as the people of God should never be absent of the throne of God and the glory of God. These are the guardians of God's glory. They care about it. Then as you go to Exodus chapter 25, we read about the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the ark is the mercy seat or what is called the throne of God, where God sits literally on the ark of the covenant in the Holy of Holies. Do you know what is there overshadowing the mercy seat are two cherubim, their wings stretched out as they watch over the glory of God, the throne of God, the presence of God, the place of meeting where the blood is shed for sinners to come. You realize it's only by the blood of the lamb you've got access to the presence of God and to a manifestation of God himself. It was at the ark God revealed himself. God spoke. God came to meet with man at the ark of the covenant. And what do you do? You see two cherubims watching over that glory in a very unusual way. It says in Isaiah 37, 16, speaking about the true and only God, thou that dwellest between the cherubims. You can identify the real God because he dwells amidst the cherubims. That's where you find him. Saints never think these cherubims are far from God. They're not. They're utterly consumed. They live for the presence of God and the glory of God and the throne of God and the person of God. And yet you can get Christians and churches and preachers that know nothing about the presence of God, nothing about the glory of God. They speak to men as a man. They play religious games and churchianity, but there's no glory in the midst. We should never be absent of the glory of God. To think of the church without God's glory is a disaster. Then when you come to Ezekiel chapter 1, for the first time we have a description of what the cherubims actually look like. Ezekiel 1 where we read is the first description. And already we see creatures that are passionate for the glory. They dwell in the presence of God. But now you get a description because God's got your attention. Now I want to give you a message concerning these cherubim because they embody things that every Christian should know and understand. 
Notice that in Ezekiel 1, the cherubims are on earth. When you go over to Revelation chapter 4, the cherubims are in heaven. But here they are actually on the earth in the midst of men. And do you know what you see? There is God's throne attached to them on the earth. In other words, where the cherubims are on the earth, God's throne is made manifest. If you hear what I preached last week and what I'm going to preach this morning, you're going to see how you can have a manifestation of God's throne in the church of Jesus Christ. God's throne is not only in heaven, it is to be made manifest or its power revealed upon the earth. There's to be a connection between God's throne in heaven and God's people on the earth. There's to be an intimate, close connection that impacts the earth in a very vital way. And so in Ezekiel 1, we have a very clear description of them manifest on the earth. When you get to Ezekiel chapter 10, listen carefully. In Ezekiel 10, you see the same cherubims and they're described and named there very clearly. But listen to what's happening. You see, Ezekiel was a young preacher, prophet of God, called at a certain time. In Ezekiel 10, it says the glory is lifting off the temple, off God's house, from amidst God's people. The glory is departing. They'll be left without the presence of God or the power of God or the manifestation. God's glory is departing. And you know what you have? You have the four cherubims are there as God's glory lifts above the temple and God is going to remove it. What a serious thing. Do you know many times through church history, when God's people sin, we lose the glory. God's glory lifts. God's presence departs. We no longer have fire in our meetings. We no longer have purity and holiness and all the marks of these cherubim. The cherubims fly away. You know why? There's no throne, no power, no glory, no fire. And so the cherubims say, we want to dwell in the presence of God. I believe these nine marks of the cherubim are only manifest in the church where the presence of God is, where the fire is. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it says these four creatures come out of the fire. It's in the midst of the fire that they appear as the appearance of a man. And yet they're angelic beings. It's extraordinary. Let me give you just a little story before I go into these three points here this morning concerning the call of Ezekiel and his day and generation. You know the story about Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament. He was a young man in Jerusalem And when Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, attacked Jerusalem because of the sin of God's people, the enemy could come up. Babylon invaded God's house. You know why Babylon has invaded God's house? Because we've sinned. We've departed. We've been rebels against God. So the glory is gone. Well, Daniel, don't think that in Babylon there's not good people. There are very good people in Babylon. Babylon isn't only apostasy. Babylon is a system where God's glory can come again. Daniel was taken away in the first captivity from Jerusalem in about the year 505 BC. Then the second captivity several years later in 597 BC was when this man Ezekiel was going to be carried away with about 10,000 other Jews And so Ezekiel gets carried as a young man in his 20s into Babylon, away from his home. Do you know he was of that royal priesthood line? In other words, he was going to be a priest in the temple, God's house. He was going to serve there. If things had carried on normally, if it was a normal hour, he would have served as a priest week in, week out, on the Sabbath, at feast times. He would have burnt incense, wore the garments, walked into the house of God. That's what Ezekiel would have been. But it's not a normal day. It's an hour of apostasy. Babylon has invaded the house of God. And Ezekiel gets carried away to Babylon. And we're told that while he's in Babylon, in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, who was the king carried off with him from Jerusalem, in the fifth year, God comes to Ezekiel and calls him to be a prophet of the Lord. 
You know what he's going to do for the rest of his ministry? He's in Babylon. He never sees Jerusalem again. He never sees the glory come again. He never sees the temple rebuilt again. But he's given a specific message. There's still people in Jerusalem. The temple hasn't been destroyed yet. But Ezekiel in Babylon begins to prophesy and warn those in Jerusalem. You know what? Everything's going to get destroyed. The glory is departing. And when the glory departs, the temple will be utterly destroyed and annihilated. The only thing keeping you from destruction is the glory and the presence of God. And so this man begins to prophesy and to speak very clearly about the departure of God's glory, the destruction of the temple, but also before the end of the book of Ezekiel, we actually read about the restoration of the glory. In fact, he prophesies to such a point that he looks down through the corridors of time, thousands of years, and he actually sees Magog, along with Iraq and Turkey and Sudan and other nations coming down and invading Israel in the last days. What a remarkable prophecy that you hold here in your hands. And so last week we began to look at six points of the cherubims that have a message for you and I. Do you understand why it could be 18 years ago when I went to preach this message? I'm going to a church where there's been glory and revival spirit and the presence of God and changed lives and leaders are gathering from the city to hear the word of God. Do you realize why God would give me a message like this to preach? You know why? The glory is just about to depart. The leaders have sinned against God. God is just about to lift his hand and immorality is about to come in on that leadership. And yet they don't know what they're doing. What a serious, serious thing. Last week we dealt with, number one, they are called living creatures. They're alive. Number two, they're always found at the throne of God. They're intimate at the throne of God. Number three, they're full of eyes, meaning they're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Number four, they have four wings, which speaks of a heavenly life, not an earthly life. Number five, they continually praise and worship God continually without ceasing. Number six is their walk. They have a holy and a pure walk. These six things that we dealt with last week show these cherubims in four seasons of time, whether it's winter or summer, whether they feel like a man, only a man, or whether they feel like a lion. These six things are going to be in place in season and out of season. You may not feel very good this morning, but are you walking right? Your walk with God has nothing to do with your personal circumstance, your feeling, your emotions, or your thoughts. Nothing. You know what it's got to do with? It's got everything to do with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. These four beasts with their four different faces represent four different periods or seasons in a Christian life. And it doesn't matter whether you think you're in winter time or summer time, you can be sparkling bright. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You can be alive unto God, dwelling in his presence. Oh, but I don't feel him. For two months, I hadn't felt him until last Sunday. I want to tell you, couldn't feel the presence of God. Didn't stop me worshiping, walking right, serving him or witnessing the sinners. It's got nothing to do with it. It is so, so real. And so here, I want to move you to the next three and final points. And in the weeks ahead, we're going to go through these four faces of the cherubim. And we're going to see that these nine marks are always there. No matter what the time or season in your life, you may feel nothing today. So what? Are you going to live right? Are you going to walk right? Are you going to speak right? Are you going to worship him this morning? And so let me bring you to seven, my seventh point here about the cherubims. Point seven, led of the spirit. That's the seventh mark about these cherubims. When you see them coming out of the fire, they are led by
by the Spirit, so should also every Christian. Look with me, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 12. And they went everyone straight forward. Whether the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. And so you see these cherubims, they went everyone straight forward. They, they could go straight. You know, when I see a Christian walk straight, do you know what it tells me? The Spirit of God is at work. When I, show, when I see someone who calls himself a Christian and they're always doing detours all over the place, I, I mean, they can't walk straight for two weeks. They can't stay in the house of God for two weeks. They can't do anything normal for two weeks. The Spirit of God is definitely not in their life. There's been a type of person who said, I'm led of the Spirit of God. After all, Jesus said, you can tell those led by the Spirit, you don't know where the wind blows. They go hither and thither. In today's church, those who claim to be led of the Spirit, really what they mean is they're inconsistent, they're unfaithful, unreliable, and they're excusing their own fleshly nature, and they're blaming the Holy Spirit and saying, I'm led of the Holy Spirit. You know nothing about the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God. That's a different spirit altogether. But notice these cherubims. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? They go straight. They go forward. There's a straightness in the movement of the cherubims because of the Holy Spirit of God. There's a mark between walking straight, being led by the Spirit of God. Someone who walks straight is led of the Spirit of God. Someone who's veering all over the place, you're not led of the Spirit of God. Definitely not. It then says, whether the Spirit was to go, they went. Notice the cherubims go nowhere. They don't make their own plans. They're angelic beings. They have perfect knowledge. They have intimacy with God. They have open revelation. And yet they don't make their own decisions. They don't make their own choices. They don't go where they want to go. Do you know what they do? They go where the Spirit goes. These cherubims are utterly submitted to following the Spirit of God. And so they walk in a straight line. This is the great mark of a real genuine Christian. Spirit led. I want to follow the Spirit of God. I don't want to make up my own plans. I'm not telling God to bless my plans And that's what man does. They create their plans. I've got an agenda for the church. God, I want you to bless it. He won't bless it. He won't bless your marriage that you conjured up. He won't bless your ministry that you forced yourself into. He won't bless a church that is a man-made institution. You know what? You want to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And so they only went if the Spirit of God moved. If the Spirit of God wasn't moving, they would stand still. If the Spirit of God went up there, they went up there. If he went down there, they went down there. But they are actually always following and they're walking straight. Notice they're not static. Some Christians have become static, stale, stubborn, and a lot of other S's I want to tell you. Oh, that they were spirit led. If you're spirit led, you're not static. You're not walking in circles. You're not stuck in a pit. You're not acting like a pig in the pigsty, but you're actually moving forward in your Christian walk. Are you maturing? Are you walking after the Spirit of God? Do you want to grow up in Jesus Christ? Do you want to stay the same with a foul smell, an odor coming off you? There's Christians I've been around, they spray themselves with perfume and deodorant and they smell very nice, but I get near them and I go, They stink, not stink physically or naturally. It's their attitudes, it's their manner of lifestyle, it's their words, it's putrid. There is a bad, bad smell. But yet those that are led by the Spirit, they're not static, they're not stuck. And it says, and they turned, not when they went. In other words, they Don't veer off. Now notice this for a moment. The cherubims, all four of them, although they represent all different seasons of time, 
being in the presence of God, they are utterly submitted. You know, some Christians, they go, I know what the Spirit of God said. I know everything, but they're not led of the Spirit. I look at their life and go, they're rebels against God. They can't walk in a straight line. They're always veering off. They say, the Spirit's leading me to do something extraordinary. Then next week, they're not obeying the Scriptures or in the weeks to come, I'll go and serve him. I'll go and obey him. The Spirit told me, what about just doing the day-to-day -day things of being led by the Spirit of God? I want to prove to you that being led by the Spirit of God doesn't always mean hearing voices or having impulses. In fact, the biblical doctrine of being led by the Spirit has nothing to do with him telling you who to marry or to go and witness to someone or to go and deliver a prophecy. It has nothing to do with that at all. And if you don't know that, you do not know what being led of the Spirit is. You ought to look that phrase up in your Strong's Concordance, led by the Spirit, and you'll get a very different teaching. You know why? And I'm going to give you it right now because it's in the Bible. I'm a Bible preacher. I'm a Bible man. The Holy Spirit gave us this book to guide us, to lead us. If you're not being led by this book, you're not led of the Holy Spirit. If you're not studying this book, you're not being taught by the Holy Spirit of God. He's not there whispering in your ear when you neglect this book and treat it as opinions that you can pick and choose along the way as you desire. A neglected Bible means that you've said no to the Holy Spirit. You're grieving him. You're quenching him. You're hindering the Spirit of God from leading your life. How is he going to lead you? He'll bring you to the Bible. Let me prove what to be led of the Spirit actually means. Romans chapter 8 verse 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Notice the context. The apostle is right and says he wants God's perfect righteousness to be fulfilled in you, to live righteously. What the law couldn't do in that it had no power. It could command you how to live righteously, but there's no power. So how is God going to make you righteous, make you live righteous, think righteous, believe righteously? Well, he gives it here. He tells you how the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in your life. It says, in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Notice it's talking about people walking after the spirit of God, in step with the spirit of God, following after the spirit of God, waiting on the spirit of God. If you walk in the spirit, Righteousness is going to be fulfilled in your life. There's nothing to do with listening for voices, learning the art of hearing God speak to you. Nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with the Spirit told me to do this. It's got everything to do with the Spirit of God, you following the Holy Spirit of God. And notice what it's contrasted with in, in Romans chapter 8. Who walk not after the flesh, Two great powers in your life. Either the flesh, your old Adamic nature, is leading you and guiding you and prompting you and making your decisions and making you make choices or else it's the Spirit of God. What is it leading your life to certain decisions, certain places? You see, I can tell when I look at someone what is leading them, either the flesh or the Spirit. Everything about their life tells me that because of how they walk their life from year to year to year. I'm not interested in dramatic conversions or what you're saved out of, whether it's drugs, crime, violence, whatever. I'm not impressed with that. Let's see if you're here in a year's time. Let's see how you're walking in six months' time. Let's see where you are in 10 years' time after we've gone through ups and downs of church history. If you're still here, that says something. I don't care if you've had a dramatic experience of seeing a vision of these four cherubims. I could care less. Where are you next Sunday morning? That's what I really care about. And so these cherubims are a testimony of being led by the Spirit of God. A real Christian is not led by the flesh. He doesn't walk according to the flesh. I think, I believe, I'm going to do this. I'm going to veg out, but after the Spirit, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. 
Someone walking after the flesh, their mind, their thinking, their intellect is towards the flesh. You care about yourself, what people think about you. It's all centered in around you. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, if you're being led by the Spirit of God, you're going, what about His glory? Not about your benefits. Saints, I, I've had a tragedy in my life, but my consuming desire is not myself. It's God's glory. It's glory in God's house. That consumes me. That absolutely burns as a fire within me. This salvation is not about me. Whether it's good what has happened in my life or bad, nothing to do with that. My entire life is concerning the glory of God. Why? I'm being led by the Spirit of God. And you know what? When He leads you, your thoughts begin to get affected. How you think, how you act, what you decide. And so you're led by the Spirit of God in a certain pathway. When it says walk after the flesh or walk after the Spirit, it's a pathway. It's not a five-minute wonder. It's not talking about an experience. It's not talking about whether you've spoken in tongues or not. You know what it is? It is a walk, day in, day out, week in, week out. All of us know the difficulty of this. Then in Romans chapter 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In other words, being led by the Spirit is essential to being called a Christian. If you're not led by the Spirit, you are not a born again Christian. This has nothing to do with having dreams, revelations or prophecies. Nothing at all. And I believe in all those things. Very much so. But this has nothing, this leading of the Spirit has to do with your regenerate, you're born again. You're a son of God. Sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Notice that word led in Romans 8, 14. It means the Spirit of God brings you, or He drives you, or He induces you. So the Holy Spirit, when you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit's working in your life to draw you. Or sometimes he gets behind you and drives you. Remember Jesus, it says he was led up into the wilderness of the Holy Spirit to be tempted. You know what the word means? To be driven of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is leading him into a wilderness where he's going to get tempted for 40 days. I would not want to put myself in the way of temptation without the Holy Spirit leading I would not through my own desires want to put myself in the way of danger. You will make disaster. If you're in a situation because you're walking with God and you get tempted and all these temptations come in around you and you're having arrows hurled at you and thoughts coming to you, thank God if you've been walking with the Spirit of God. He's going to help you through this time. He'll lead you. He'll guard you. He'll keep you. Galatians chapter 5, 16 as well. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, do not kid yourself that you're walking in the Spirit. You can't do both of these. Fulfill all the lusts, the desires, the promptings, the urgings of the flesh, and then come in on a Sunday morning and think that you are walking in the Spirit. You're moving, acting, impacted by the Spirit of God. Don't be deceived by that. To be born of the Spirit of God brings you into a place where you can walk in the Spirit, but you need to walk this out. And you know what? We've all failed along the way. We've all sinned against God. We've all grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit. Not one person, and believe me, if you think you have, please come and speak to me afterwards. I want to shake your hand. For it says, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. Your flesh is utterly opposed to the Holy Spirit. How, how can I tell what the flesh is? It hates the Spirit of God. So when I begin to teach the Word of God, it doesn't take very long with people. Those who do not love the things of God, they're not led of the Spirit of God. It's not very long before they go, I don't believe that. I don't like that. No one can tolerate that. I'm not going to submit myself to that. Yes, I, and I know why. You know why? Because the flesh 
lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. You're walking in the flesh. That's why you don't obey the word of God or submit yourself to the word of God. You know what? If you're being led by the spirit, walking in the spirit, you would hate the flesh. You'd have, all of us have a problem with the flesh. Be honest. It's true, isn't it? This preacher knows what the flesh is. And I'm telling you, it's an enemy. I hate the flesh. I know the thoughts of the flesh. I know the desires of the flesh. I'm not immune. It hasn't been removed from me in a supernatural experience. I know the flesh that is Keith Malcolmson. And I'm t- I want to walk in the spirit because that flesh, if it gets its way, I know what it will do. It will fulfill its own desires. And so uh, the only answer is to walk with the spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, you're under grace. Lots of people say, hey, I'm under grace. Nine times out of ten in today's church when they say, I'm under grace, you know what they're saying? I'm a rebel, I'm disobedient, I blaspheme, I'm selfish, I'm proud, I'm arrogant. I let my tongue let rip on whoever, but I'm under grace, no condemnation. Don't condemn me. You're not allowed to see my sins. It's under the blood. But the Bible actually says, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Those that are led by the Spirit are walking right, not according to the flesh. Not being under the law is not an excuse for the flesh to hide and say, I'm under grace. The flesh cannot hide under grace. It cannot. There is no room. The Holy Spirit moves you into a place of of being under grace, not under the law, where you're free. You know, you can always tell someone who's walking in the grace of God to walk right. It's the great mark of it. Being under grace isn't a claim of protection and of hiding from your flesh. You know, someone who walks in grace actually has the power to walk the world in white. They have power to rise above the world. And so you see in this seventh point that the cherubims have a message of always following the spirit of God. They don't turn aside. They don't begin in the spirit and go off in the flesh. Oh, you began well. You ran well. Wonderful testimony for three years. Then you went AWOL. You can begin in the flesh and end up, sorry, you can begin in the spirit and end up in the flesh. Some people say, if you end up in the flesh, you are never in the spirit. Rubbish, not according to Galatians. Paul said, you began in the spirit. There was a miracle. You were saved by faith in the spirit. But then somewhere you got into the law. Somewhere you got into the flesh. And the flesh led you. Now you're in the flesh. You're under law. You're under a spirit of bondage. How do I know you're under law? Grace, grace, grace. (laughs) Really, I know you're under law. You know why? You can't even obey God. The mark of someone under law is you cannot live holy. You're under a spirit of bondage. You're a prisoner. You can't live right, speak right, do right for any consistent time. You're, you're always veering off. Oh, I started so well. I know I had the spirit. The spirit follows me, you know. You're an apostate Christian. Do you know apostate Christianity has the Holy Spirit in their pocket? They carry him about. Isaiah talks about carving out a Holy Spirit. You've done something damaged the Holy Spirit. You've carved out a Holy Spirit in your own image. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit told me, it's your blasphemous idolatry. You've made a Holy Spirit in your image and he tells you what you want to hear. He'll tell you to go pray for the sick. He'll give you a prophecy, but you can't live right. That is not the real Holy Spirit. I want the real Holy Spirit that was actually... um, the same as these cherubims. When we begin to look at the cherubims, we see what it is to be spirit-led. Number eight, their witness. Not only being led of the spirit, but their witness. Look at verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightnings 
And the living creatures, they returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. I believe these two verses show that the cherubims, this is their witness. And it's an example to you and I. Our witness, our evangelism, our preaching, our life of reaching out into this darkness, being light in the midst of darkness. The name cherubims means burning ones. They're on fire. They came out of fire. They're forged in fire. They're kept in the fire. They actually have fire within them. And when you see here that they, their appearance, when you look at them, you cannot behold the cherubims without seeing fire. You know the problem in our churches, there's no fire anymore. Where's the fire in the evangelism? It becomes academic. You know how you tell evangelisms become academic? You, you go, oh, what do you want Jesus to do for you? You never deal with sin. You don't preach the blood. You don't deal with repentance. And that basically sums up most evangelism in today's church. All the big mega speakers have changed evangelism. They're not a burning coal of fire. I'm tired I could call them lots of things, but fire does not come to my mind. When you see the real witness of a real Christian, there is fire, not superficial fire, not false fire, not counterfeit fire. This is fire that's come out of the presence of God. And this is their witness, burning coals of fire. When you see a cherubim, it's like burning coals of fire. This is their witness, their evangelism. This is how they affect sinners in this world. You know, if you can sit with sinners, and you're silent, and you've got nothing to say to them, and there's no, I, I understand what it's like to fail and struggle and have difficulty to witness, don't we all? <clears throat> I still, as a preacher, I, I sit with the sinner and say, oh, God, help me. God, help me. I, I don't have the ability of my own self. But if you can be in with sinners constantly, and your heart doesn't break and grieve and burn and say, I've got to reach them. They're going to hell. They're going to die and be lost. Saints of God, where are the coals of fire? When you look at the cherubims, we're reminded of Isaiah chapter 6, how a coal of fire was taken off the altar in the presence of God and carried by the seraphims to touch the very tongue of the prophet. In other words, the coal of fire speaks about your testimony, your preaching, your evangelism. It's where a coal of fire touches your tongue. You cannot be silent. Your tongue is set on fire of heaven. Remember how James talks about having your tongue set on fire of hell. You know, churches have been ruined by people who have a tongue set on fire of hell. They tell lies. They cause division. They squabble. They debate. Oh, it's worse than that. As soon as you close the meeting, they want to talk about sports. You're, you're going to be scared in this two weeks to talk about sport after the meeting. Do you know if you can stand and talk and all you want to do is talk about sport or the news or politics or even the Great Reset. And I, I, I'd love to talk about the Great Reset. That bore me to tears. I want to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk about your spiritual condition. Someone who only talks about nominal things and can't talk about Jesus. You're either backslidden or you're not born again. Never were born again. You've got no interest in spiritual things. But look at these cherubims. They are like coals of fire burning in the presence of God. It also says another thing. They have the appearance of a lamp. So when you look upon them, coals of fire are a burning lamp. That's what you think of. You can't think of them. This isn't friendship evangelism. This isn't user-friendly evangelism. Sinners who see a real Christian on fire, they go, you know what? I can't be around them too long. They'll burn me. They'll scorch me. They'll consume me. I'm going to catch fire here. Need to be very careful letting them into my home. Why? The whole place might go on fire. I might begin to hate sin and hate the flesh and hate the world. You know, when you're with someone who's on fire from God, you will either resent them or love them with all of your heart, one or the other. You might enjoy them for a time. Go, praise God, isn't he wonderful? 
After a week, you go, this guy's going to do my head in. There's, there's a problem here. It says in Psalm 104, verse 4, God who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. When God is allowed to work in a individual, he makes them a flame of fire. This is the work of God. He wants you to burn. He wants your tongue on fire with a coal of fire. He wants your life to be ablaze. Imagine telling someone the true gospel and yet there's no fire in your life. No reality. See, fire proves what is real. And there's some people they want to witness to others, to tell them what they should do. And yet when they look at your life, there's no reality. There's no power. There's no separation. Why, why would I listen to you when there's no fire? I desire fire. Fire is the mark of God. It says again in John chapter 5, 35 about John the Baptist. He was a burning and a shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Then you're glad he got his head chopped off. Remember Herod came out. Herod loved John the Baptist. He came out in his chariot with his soldiers. And he loved to hear John the Baptist. He loved to hear fire and brimstone. He loved to hear about holiness. He actually felt so bad. He enjoyed it. But very shortly... When he watched that little girl dancing, he said, I'll give you anything for your body and your looks. Give me John's head. Man, I swore. That's what people do with those who burn. They can enjoy it, like it, want to be around it, but eventually they'll have it killed. That shows you hate the fire. We need fire in our evangelism church. You know, if your fire was burning, you would be propelled out of this church. You would be begging me for street meetings if there is fire. Fire would so consume you, you couldn't have slept in your bed last night. Some of you got up in the middle of the night for the wrong reason, worrying or distracted with the things of this life. But real fire in the Christian's life you know what it does? It makes you burn for the souls of men. It makes you burn for the high street. Kindle the fire. Let God make you a consuming fire and you will seek out sinners. You won't be thinking about yourself. What about me? What about my life? Your life is soon going to be over. Your job will be no more. You'll be separated from your family. You know, I can't reach Candace. I can talk to her. She's not there. I can reach out on the bed. She's not there. I'll never have another conversation. She's gone. Only what I've done for Christ will matter. If Christ was not my life, where would it be at this point? Saints of God, you've got to be on fire for God. Your job is temporary. Your family is temporary. Your lifestyle is temporary. Your enjoyments here are temporary. But the fire for evangelism is another whole thing. It says here, that this fire went up and down among the living creatures. In other words, it was more than them. It wasn't just that they looked like fire. This burning fire actually moved in their midst as they gathered together. Where they were, there was a fire burning in their gathering. Right in the midst of them, it went up and down. You see, this fire to be a witness, to tell people about Christ, to burn brightly in this world, it's not your fire. It is God's fire burning in your life. It is something separate from you, but it consumes you and it makes you burn. But since we need this fire in our church meetings and gathering, this fire is something separate from them. It's not natural. It came from God. It also says the fire was bright. It was clear. It was distinct. You know about fire, you see things in the light of fire. It is very clear. You can read by firelight, by candlelight. You could read a book if your eyes are still good enough to do that by a candle. It brings clarity. It brings discernment. I hate evangelism where there's no clarity. The first thing the Holy Spirit does in evangelism, he deals with your sin. When your sin gets dealt with, if you draw back and you hide yourself, you've just put yourself in John chapter 3. They don't come to the light because they don't want their works to be exposed. So whether a saint or a sinner, someone who draws back from the light, it's actually because you know sin is going to be revealed by the light. 
I'll, I'll tell you what real evangelism fire is like. It reveals things. It reveals darkness. It shines in darkness. If you've got no light in your evangelism, it's educational. It's theoretical. Come and be blessed. Come and get heaven. Come and have all your sins forgiven. But you never deal with the sin of the tongue, the attitude of all that they have done. That's not evangelism. It also says here, concern and lightning. And out of the fire went forth lightning. You know what lightning is? It's fearful. Have you ever been caught in a thunderstorm with lightning coming around you? I can remember when I was young sometimes getting caught in those thunderstorms. We don't get many nowadays. It is fearful. It is awe-inspiring. Remember Martin Luther got saved in the midst of a, sorry, he didn't get saved. In the midst of a thunderstorm, the lightning's coming down and he, he makes a vow to some saint, whatever, to go into the priesthood. He got so scared out of his wits, he come out of normal lifestyle and locked himself away as a celibate priest because the lightning scared him. Lightning is an awe-inspiring, majestic thing. It comes suddenly, then comes the clap of thunder. Lightning represents judgment, seriousness, sobriety, clarity, a flash of lightning. It also says in verse 14, the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. We're talking about their witness, their evangelism. You know what? They run. They run as a witness. Oh, that God would make some of you to run. Outrun the preacher. Who's around about you? Run to the mission field. Run to the pulpits of the earth. You know, one of the greatest pulpits in this city is lying empty today. You know where it is? It's on the high street of Limerick. It is the greatest pulpit that you could ever imagine. I'm preaching here because I'm called to preach here and I know the will of God and I reluctantly come into the pulpit. I never wanted to preach in churches. The high street was where God called me. I love to evangelize. Every week I preached on the street for decades. I love to be on the high street, evangelizing, tracting, reaching sinners, talking to the JWs, witnessing to the Mormons, reaching out to the young children, going door to door. You know, in my 20s, the area we were in, I, I overseen a team. We covered towns, not one town, towns evangelizing every single door. We went village by village, town by town, and we organized it all and made sure we went to every single door with a gospel tract. They actually run these cherubims and they returned. In other words, it's not prolonged. They run. You can't run forever. You've got to walk sometimes. You've got to sit sometimes. You've got to stand and fight at other times. But here it's talking about their witness. They run and then they return as the appearance of a flash of lightning. It is sudden. It is quick. It is dramatic. Some evangelism has to be that. Remember how I told you up round outside Edinburgh in Scotland and we'd drive in there during the day and there was big massive roundabouts. Uh, uh, it was crazy. So all the cars are lined up. We're trying to get past Edinburgh. We'd always say, are you going to do it or am I going to do it today? And you jump out the door and you begin to track all the cars. I'd be driving or maybe one of them driving, whoever. And we'd begin to evangelize. And then before we got too far, pick them up again and go on and say, Lord, begin to move on those souls. You know what it was like? Lightning. Less than five minutes. And we've already done a lot of damage for the kingdom of God. Or late on a Friday night, driving through, we'd come into a village. I'd nudge the guy, say, if there's 10 people in this square, you've got to jump out and preach for five minutes. And this is how we had do it. You know what? You can be a lightning strike for God. You know what? When you do this, you don't die of boredom on the sitting in a pew in a church. I'm telling you. Number nine, with this I'm going to finish. Their unity. Their unity. See, the cherubims are always plural. In Genesis, you see two. Ezekiel, you see four. Revelation, you see four. You don't see cherubims wandering around, isolated by themselves. 
They don't do that. There's something wrong when you see a cherubim by itself. Really drastically wrong. It says in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. Now notice this. It's saying all four cherubims. When you get cherubims together, they join two of their wings together. In other words, they're close enough to join wings with the next cherubim. All four are joined. Their wings are joined. What's their wings? The heavenly life. It represents that not earthly life, not fleshy life, but that heavenly living above this world. And they reach out and they touch each other's wings. They're not separated by large distance. Do you know real Christians should not be separated by large distance? You need to work to reach out to your brothers and sisters. There's got to be a, con well, no one understands me. Join the club. I thought only one person in the entire world's ever understood me, and now she's in glory. I tell you, join the club. You need to reach out. You need to touch some other believers. It is a work of every cherubim to reach out their wings, their heavenly life. You know, some people are living a heavenly life, and they're not in unity with other Christians. There's something wrong with your wings. They're broken. But if you have a real heavenly life, you desire to touch other Christians or to be in fellowship. It says they turned not when they went. So they're in unity. They, all of their wings are joined and they move like this. As they move, they're in unity. They're joining their wings together. There's no apostasy amongst them. There's no disunity they're moving in rank and file. They're all in the right place. Now, I'm not talking about ecumenism. You know, in our day and generation, unity means we all join together. You can be a Catholic Christian, and you can be a Baptist Christian. You can be a wine-drinking Christian, and you can be a worldly Christian, and you can be a Christian that doesn't believe in churches. You can be everything, but we're all one. We're in unity. That is not real unity. That's apostasy. You know what you see in the cherubims of today's church? They all go in different directions, do different things. They know nothing about each other. You know what that is? It's apostasy. A cherubim by itself, not reaching out to others. It's a cherubim that's really gone wrong. Notice they move in unity. Unity aids their forward movement. Together they move forward. Together they go forward. You know, unity helps your forward movement in God. You want to go somewhere in God. You want to move forward. You cannot do that alone. We've got to do that as a church. You, as my brother and sister, we need to do this together. We go forward together. We grow together. We do the will of God together. That's what church life is. There is unity with these cherubims. They move in unity. It's not an ecumenical unity. You know, today's church... Once it gets unity, it fears off. Kneel to the left. Kneel to the right. We're all going back to Rome because the Holy Spirit, it's a new move of God. You know the Toronto bunch from 1994? Remember the Toronto revival, all the laughing revival? Do you know what the leaders of that revival are saying today? The Spirit's saying, go back to Mother Rome. We're joining up with Pope Francis. We're all going to be one. That's where the Toronto spirit has ended up. That's where it's gone. I'm telling you, I know all of those movements that said, we've got the spirit every five years. All of them are going back to Pope Francis. And he is the most apostate Pope who's ever been there. Even the good Catholics know that he's a new world order Pope. And yet the silly born again Christians are saying, the spirit of God is unifying us all. You know what that is? That is apostasy. That is dangerous, but it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a movement of the Spirit of God where the church of God, real Christians, are moving together in unity. You know, someone who's led by the Spirit of God is going to walk in a similar way to others and around them. If you're following Scripture and I'm following Scripture, we're going to meet somewhere along this journey. It's got to happen. 
It's so vital that we mix together as believers. You know why you're kept in check? Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpeneth iron. Remember, Proverbs is called the wisdom of God. Iron sharpens iron. You know what happens with iron? When, when you sharpen, both bits of iron get sharpened, not just one. So you're rubbing off the other bit of iron. Both are literally becoming better by that process. It's not to destroy. It's not damaging. It's not blunting them. Some Christians are blunting their edge, hammering someone with their edge. No profit to it. But this rubbing of one another, what does the Bible say? So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You know, you could be in the doldrums, in the pit, sad, and you get someone coming, rubbing, talking, exhorting, encouraging, fellowshipping with you. And you go, boy, that hour, I so needed it. This fellowship, we're sharpening one another. Oh, that we'd have fellowship like that, dwelling together. An isolated person doesn't have that. You go down all sorts of strange avenues. There's no one to correct you saying, brother, are you sure you should be doing that? Who do you think you are? Where's your church? I don't submit to anyone. Oh, heard it all. It's boring. It's actually boring. They're bereft of the Spirit of God. They know nothing about Scripture. But there is a rubbing together. It may not feel good sometimes, but it's so wonderful that people care about you. It says in Ezekiel 1.16, And they four had one likeness. Oh, their faces are different. They're very unusual. And yet they have one likeness. Four different living creatures. One likeness. What is the likeness? It is Christ likeness. They have a family similarity. You know, there's certain qualities in a person's life. That tells me you're, you're not in the family. You may want to be. You may act like you are. But you cannot be in this family. There's a certain DNA. There's a certain likeness. You see, every Christian, I just have to test with this. And I go, you're not in the family. You can't be. Then there's others who are doubting their salvation. I go, but you're a family member. You have all the traits, all the likeness. Oh, I'm so weak. I'm struggling. I understand that. But you know what? There's a certain likeness and similarity. Now, I said they're never alone. Isn't that right? Didn't I just say that? Cherubims are never alone. That's not true. There's only one exception in our entire Bible where you will find one cherubim by itself. Ezekiel 28 verse 14. Speaking about Lucifer. Remember what the word Lucifer means. It means light bear, brightness. Listen to what it says. Speaking of Lucifer. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. This is about Lucifer before he fell, before sin was found in him. You know what it says? He was a light bearer. Thou art. He had the anointing of God, the Holy Spirit. He had a gifted ministry. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. In other words, Lucifer covered the glory of God at the throne of God amidst the fire of stones. It goes on to talk about that. You walked up and down in the midst of the fire, fire of stones, stones of fire. Do you realize Lucifer was right in the midst of the heart of these cherubims? Do you realize he cared about the glory of God? He covered the glory of God. He was anointed to this task and yet sin was found in him. Now he is an isolated individual cherub, one cherub, all alone, separate, not two, not four. He is utterly alone. You know what that tells me? The cherubims have a message of gravitating together, being unified in the presence of God. How can you dwell at the throne of God? How can you be filled with eyes or filled with spirit? How can you have four wings, the heavenly life, and not be joined with other Christians? Not in an assembly where you can help it. And I know there's many watches online. They're scattered. They can't find a church. 
But I tell you what, they do their best to be a part of us in a very real way. And God blesses them and there's an impact on their life. You know what? They're stretching out through technology with their wings, their heavenly wings, and go, I want to hear that sort of preaching. I believe that. I need to hear the word of God. It impacts me on my living room floor. I tell you, they're stretching their wings. Yet you could have someone sitting here. They're not even bothering to lift their wing right in the middle of this room here this morning. Let me finish with one scripture here this morning as we close. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak different things. No, it doesn't say that. I'm glad you realized that ye all speak the same thing. That's impossible. It's a command. It's not an option. It's not a thought. It's not a preference. He's actually exhorting them. I beg you, all speak the same thing. That doesn't mean uniformity to the preacher. doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you've got to act like Keith Malcolmson or speak like Keith does. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we just merge all our resources. We're all to speak the same thing. In other words, it's to be tested by the word of God. If you believe the word of God and I believe the word of God, there's going to be a similarity of what we speak. We're going to deal with sin. We're going to go to our brother privately before we gossip about them. If you gossip rather than going to a brother, you're not speaking the same thing. You don't even believe what the Bible says. You're not even trying to do it. But it goes further. And that there be no divisions among you. I'm begging you. No divisions in this church, but that ye be perfectly joined together. Do you know what that term perfectly joined together means? It means to be mended, to be framed, repair, to put in order, or to adjust. This actually Greek word was used by doctors in, at the time of the early church, and they used it for setting a bone back in place that become disjointed. Thank God I've never had a bone out of joint. But if you have that, this is the medical term where you're still part of the body. You are a member, but you're out of place. And it's painful. It is sore. You're not functioning right. You can't do the will of God. You're out of place. And so the medical term means perfectly joined together. Put in that right place. Put right back in the right place in the body of Christ. In the same mind and in the same judgment. So your thinking, your words, and your judgment is to be the same. This is not conformity to a church, a denomination, or a man. This is conformity to the man on the throne, God's word, to the Holy Spirit. The word judgment means opinions, ideas, or thoughts of the mind. It doesn't mean to weigh up and make a judgment, and we make the same judgment. It doesn't mean that. It means your ideas. For all the years I've been in the church, there's an awful lot of basic stuff is not in place. I could spend the rest of my ministry preaching on the most obvious elementary scriptures, and I know for a fact that most could care less, and that it's not in place in the best of churches. I know that for a fact. And I could spend the rest of my days just pointing out the obvious because it's radical and it's powerful and it's amazing. And so I've given you three more points. Led of the Spirit, their witness and their unity. In the cherubims, we have now seen nine points where if you hear the message of Ezekiel chapter 1, you're going to see there's nine points here where the cherubims carry a message for me. Now in the weeks ahead, you're going to start to see that it doesn't matter the season. You could be in winter. This works. You could be in summer or autumn or springtime. Doesn't matter. All of these nine things are to be in a place functioning. You never have an excuse. It doesn't matter if your wife dies. It doesn't matter if your husband dies. It doesn't matter if you lose your job. It doesn't matter if you're sad. It doesn't matter if you're lacking money or friends. It doesn't matter any of those things. You know what? There's never an excuse not to be a real Christian or the fulfillment of the word of God. Please stand with me here this morning.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Oh, we bless you. We thank you. Father, we're praying right now. Let's pray together. Lord God, we're praying in Jesus' mighty name. We're looking for a moving of the Spirit of God. We're not looking to be earthbound creatures. Lord God, we're not looking to have a backslidden dead Christianity. We're not looking for an ecumenical form of Christianity. But Lord God, we're looking for something burst of the living God that comes out of fire. Lord God, that is according to the Word of God. We're looking to be led by the Spirit of God here this morning. My God, I pray for the power of God to be released on lives. Oh God, as we had repent of issues in our life, my God, set people on fire in this room. Lord God, they're going to pursue after souls. Make us a fire, a burn fire, a fire burning. Lord God, in our workplaces, in our families, in our home, on our street, oh God. Lord God, reignite the fire. Lord God, let us be led, oh God, by the Holy Spirit of God, not to fulfill the lust of the flesh but Lord God to walk with you and Father we're praying for that unity of the Holy Spirit my God unify us join us together with one heart and spirit of mind that we as a church might speak the same thing and think the same thing and have the same judgment or the same opinion on things in Jesus name Amen